Good morning. In John chapter 17, we see Jesus on the night uh, that he is going to be betrayed. We see Jesus uh, on the night he's about to head to the Garden of Gethsemane, be be betrayed by one of his own disciples, and be given up to the the Jews and then to the Romans. And uh, he knows imminently he is going to his his death. Um, And in chapter 17 we see Jesus give this, this great prayer uh, for the behalf of himself and for the behalf of the, of the disciples and for the behalf of us. And in this passage, we see, uh, first of all, Jesus start off by praying that God would glorify him to accomplish his work before him. And we understand that to mean that Jesus prays that um, as this time comes, that God will be with him as he, as he dies and he, as he dies for our sins. Then he turns and he moves on and he prays for the apostles. And he prays the apostles would keep them in your name, in the name of Jesus, that they would follow his teachings. He prays that they would, uh, that God would keep the apostles from the evil one, keep the apostles away from sin and, and evil. And then he prays that he would sanctify the apostles in truth. But in verses 20 through 26, we see Jesus pivot. Um, And in this passage, in verses 20 through 26, we see Jesus uh, pray for another different group of people. This morning, we're going to look closely at this passage. We're going to look at John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26, and we're going to try to extrapolate what does this passage have to say to us. And the first thing we need to do is we need to understand and dissect who is Jesus praying for. Um, So read with me John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. I do not pray for these only, but also those who would believe in me through their word. So we have two groups of people that, are, that Jesus brings up. We have these and those. Um, we understand who these are from the immediate context. We see just previously, Jesus has been praying for these, for the apostles and the disciples who are with them. And so we understand that. That's pretty clear. But then he brings up those who will believe in me through their word, through the words of the apostles and the disciples. Um, And so we get to this idea that Jesus is now praying for those who would believe based on the word of the apostles. Um, If you jump to chapter 20, uh, verses 29 through 31, uh, we see Jesus talking to Thomas. This is after Jesus has been resurrected, and we know that Thomas has, has been doubting Thomas says, I will not believe unless I see Jesus' body and I touch it and I I feel his wounds. And Jesus appears to him and says to him, "Uh, do you believe now? And he says something profound. He says, you believe because you have seen me and you have touched me, but blessed are those who believe even though they haven't seen me. And he goes on to talk about how the, the gospel he has written, the gospel of John, as written by the apostle John, as written, so that you may believe that Jesus is Christ the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. We get this sort of purpose statement, in which John is kind of reemphasizing what he says in chapter 17, verse 20. Uh, There are those who will believe based on the words and the teachings of the apostles, including the people that are reading the Gospel of John then and now. Um, We understand that the Gospel of John was written, you know, quite a bit after Jesus' ascension, like 30 to 50 years. And so there's people reading the gospel that had never been able to meet Jesus. And Jesus is now praying for those people. But Jesus is also praying for us. Because none of us were blessed to to physically meet Jesus and to physically see Jesus and to uh, literally be taught by Jesus as the apostles were. But all of us believe based on the words the apostles have written for us. So when we read this passage, as as we go through this, we need to understand, Jesus is praying for us, the the modern future Christian who believes based on the accounts of those who did see. Um, Jesus is praying for us. And what does he pray for us? Let's read the rest of the passage. Let's read uh, verses 21 through 26. What does Jesus pray for us? Um. I pray that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they might be one, even as we are one. I in them, you in me, 
that they might become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the creation of this world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you sent me. I have known them, I have made known them to your name, and I will continue to make it known. The love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus prays that we might be one. That is what Jesus prays. He prays that we might become one. And we see three different aspects of this as we read the passage. First of all, we see that Jesus prays that we are one with one another, that we become perfectly united. Um, we see that in verse 21. Um, I do not ask for these, or that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Um, we look at this word one, uh, and the, the, the definition for it is something along the lines of um, one single entity. Um, it is it is this idea that we are united in uniformity around an idea. Um, it's basically saying unity. It's another word for unity. Jesus is praying for the unity of the future Christians, of those that would believe by the word of the apostles. He's praying for unity within the church, that we among each other, among the church, would be united. And that's his hope and his expectation for us. Jesus prayed that the future Christians, that the future church, might become united as one. Um, he goes as far as to say that they might be perfectly one, just as I am in you and you are in me. Perfectly one, just as, the, as God and the Son are one. Um, now, what this is not teaching, this is not teaching that each individual Christian should become identical. It's not describing us as, as perfect clones of one another. It's not describing us as like, uh, drones in a, in a hive of bees. We're not identical. And we see that in, in passages like 1 Corinthians 12, where it describes how we are one body made up of individual members. Each individual member is supposed to have his own um, thoughts and feelings, his own talents, his own gifts. And each individual member of the church is supposed to use those individual gifts that they are given. We're not clones of one another. Instead, we come together with our differences to build one unified body. And we see that clearly. Um, we as a group are to be united. We are to have unity. Now, that's where this gets difficult because as humans, we understand that when lots of people with lots of ideas come together, it doesn't bring unity often. And we understand the way of the world. Um, so typically, when you bring lots of people and lots of ideas together, uh, you find division. So how is it? How do we do this? As Christians, how do we come together to find unity with one another when as individuals we have so much that differs us, that divides us? And I think we're given the answer very clearly, uh, especially in verses 25 and 26. Um, A righteous father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have no made known to them by your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. I think the two things that unify us as the church are our knowledge and love. That's what we're going to see here. Um, how do we become unified? We become unified by knowing God. Uh, this word for know is this idea of experiential knowledge. It's, it's learning and, and understanding who God is by our experience. And think about this. If each of us individually comes to know God greater, if we come to know God's will for us individually, then as a whole, we all become closer to God. And as all of us become closer to God, we become more similar. What unites us becomes more pronounced in us and in our lives. And we, by proxy, become more united. And that's, that includes our knowledge of God as well. When we understand what God wants for us, and when we follow what God wants for us individually, as a group, we all follow God and we become more unified. Um, in the same way, we see this with love. Uh, the word for love here is agape, this idea of sacrificial love. Love for one another is so great that we are willing to sacrifice ourselves 
for one another. So how does that bring about unity? Well, when we as individuals have friction, when, when I have problems with you and when you have problems with me, can you imagine if I am willing to sacrifice myself for your sake and if you are willing to sacrifice yourself for my sake? Problems dissolve. What would divide us and would make things worse tends to fix itself when we care for one another and when we love one another more than we love ourselves. That is how the church finds unity. Uh, we don't find unity in our own personal opinions and we don't find unity in selfishness. Our own personal opinions move out of the way when we understand and when we know God and when we know his will for us. Our selfishness, selfishness gets out of the way when we understand sacrificial love for one another, when we sacrifice self for others. That is the path for the unity in the church. Jesus' desire and Jesus' prayer for us as the church, as the Christians of the future, is that we, have, that we as a church become one, that we have unity with one another. And that is possible. Um, secondly, we see that he also desires that we become that we become one with him and with the Father. Uh, as we continue reading verse 21, that's made apparent. Uh, that they would be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. God wants us to be in, us, in him. In verse 23 it says, uh, I in them, you in me, that they might become perfectly one. Jesus with God, us with Jesus, us with God, all perfectly one. Perfectly made perfect. Um, Verse 24 says, I desire that they may be with me to see the glory that you have given me. So what unites us with God and what unites us with Jesus in part is the glory of God. And I think this is kind of a difficult concept sometimes. Um, I think the easiest way to understand what it means by the glory of God is actually to jump all the way back to Exodus. If you look at Exodus, uh, Exodus 33 and 34, we see this account where Moses asks to see the glory of God. And God just and God retorts, and he says, um, if any of man should see me in my glory, he would surely die. And so as, as the account goes into uh, chapter 34, Moses sees only the, the glimpse of the back of God. And that is enough to turn Moses and to make, and to make Moses uh, glow. This, this word for glory is talking about the splendor and the brilliance and the, the majesty of God. It's kind of like the fullness of God. It's like God in his purest form in some ways. So we're reading that um, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, uh, will be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me, Lord. So God has given Jesus the same glory, and Jesus, by proxy, in verse 22, that glory that you have given to me, I have given to them. So we are now called to share in this glory sharing this majesty. So what does all of this mean? Well, um, I take it to mean that it means that through Jesus' actions, we also have become heirs to God's kingdom. We have been become children of God. Uh, our salvation is given to us. We are going to be promised and we are going to be allowed access to salvation where we will be in the glory of God forever. We will share in the glory of God in eternity. Jesus is saying here, and Jesus is praying, that we, those future Christians, would share in the glory of God in eternity, that we would be a part of his salvation. Um, I kind of think of it as almost like this, this exclusive club in some ways. Uh, it's those who are allowed into the presence of the glory of God, and we aren't invited, or we weren't invited. But we know a guy. Jesus is allowing us into this exclusive club, where once... Mankind couldn't be in the presence of God without surely dying. Now Jesus has made us pure and made us uh, clean so that we can share in the glory of God. Um, we weren't worthy before, but through Christ we were made worthy and we are now united with him and united with the Father. Jesus is praying that we have unity with one another and Jesus is now praying that we have unity with him and with the Father. He's praying that we all share in the glory of God. Jesus prayed that you would share in the glory of God for all of eternity. And Jesus died so you could share in the glory of God for all of eternity. Um, Jesus desperately wants you 
to share in the glory of God for all eternity. So why would we want to disappoint him? If we have the ability and the, time, and the power to, to take on Jesus, to allow Jesus to remove our sins and to share in this glory, and if that is what Jesus desperately wants us to do, then by all means, we should do that. Jesus prays that we all would be one with him and one with the Father. And that leads us to the third, third thing that I think Jesus prays. Jesus prays that our unity would influence the world around us. And he makes that clear throughout the passage. Um, we see that in, the, in, in verse 21, in verse 25, in verse 23. Uh, we, Jesus prays that all may be made one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And then again in verse 23. I pray that they might become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them even as you love me. Um, I think we first of all need to define the world. In the Gospel of John and in the letters to John, uh, John talks about the world pretty often. And typically he means it, he, he defines this term, the world, to mean something along the lines of those who do not know God. It is those who don't have a part in God already. Um, it's, it's those who are separated from God, maybe. So God wants those who are separated from him, who don't know him, to come to know him by experiencing the unity of us. Our unity with one another and our unity with God should lead the world to understand a little bit about him. Um, it's clear that Jesus wants the world to know about him, and that's why our unity is so important, or at least that's one reason why our unity is so important. The unity of the church should be such that it causes those who don't know God to believe in Jesus and to know that Jesus is from God. So let's think about this for a second. We look at the world, and we clearly see that the world in large is a very divided place. Uh, you uh, see that the world is a place of fighting, of disagreements, of bickering. There's hatred between one another. If you watch the news, you see wars, you see politics in which the same people are completely divided and at each other's throats. Um, you see that there's cultural divides, there's racial divides, there's generational divides in which one people are so divided and so dispersed. It makes you almost think that the United States aren't united anymore. It makes you think that families aren't united anymore when you look at the, the way the world works. And that is the way of the world. But now contrast that. Contrast that with how Jesus describes the perfect unity of the church. Um, Jesus' vision of the church as one. You have a world divided seeing us as a place where all agree that God's way is the right way and everybody follows his plan. You see the church become this place where there's not my individual uh, uh, way of thinking and your individual way of thinking all constantly at odds. You see, my way of thinking is God's way of thinking, and your way of thinking is God's way of thinking. We have unity, we have agreement, and we don't have the divisions that the world sees. Also consider that the world comes to this place, this, this church as Jesus wants it to be, this church that is one, and so they see this place where um, people who might have been inclined to fighting instead sacrifice for one another. They have this love for one another where, uh, you know, the young and the old, the, the, um, the poor and the rich, the, the people of all races come together and they have all the reasons to bicker, but they don't because of the sacrifice, sacrificial love for one another. How is the world going to respond to this sight? The world's going to know this, and the world is going to want to be a part of this. The world wants to be a part of a place where people are united. They're going to ask us, what is so different about this place, that this place can function, that this place can uh, have unity and rest when the rest of the world is divided? And that gives us the opportunity to say, Jesus is the one who makes us different. I think that's what Jesus is getting at when he prays all of this when he prays that there is unity in the church that makes us one, that the world might see and that the world might come to know him. The church should be a place that is so different from the world that the world sees us and that the world wants to be a part of us. 
That brings us to the question, is, is Lancaster Church of Christ, are we that kind of place? Are we the kind of place where people want to be a part of us? Do they see us as united with one another and united with God? And do they see this as a thing that they want to be a part of? I think, I think largely, yes. I think we do a good job. Um, I genuinely think we are a good church. But we aren't perfect. That's kind of the point here. Uh, there is room for us to improve the unity within our congregation, within the church. And that's what Jesus wants from us. Uh, we can all strive individually to grow closer to God, to know God more, to deepen our relationship with God. And as we do, as you become closer to God, as I become closer to God, as the rest of us become closer to God, our unity becomes tighter. We become more as one. And in the same ways, um, when I strive to love you better and you strive to love me better, and all of us strive to have a deeper love for one another, the unity of the body becomes greater, and we become one. Jesus hopes that we are going to be able to teach the world about him based on our unity. Um, this also implies that the world needs to see us. If we become closed off and sectioned off, and there's nobody visiting, and there's nobody to interact with us, how will they even know? How will they know that there's a place of unity in a world of division? It implies that part of our evangelism needs to be just having the world see us and understand us. Think about this. When you invite people to church, when somebody outside of this congregation comes and visits us, do they see us as that place that, that attracts them? Building this form of unity is a form of evangelism. This is, in part, how we will teach the world to come to know Jesus, by making the church a place that attracts the world, so that when us, as the congregation, bring other people in, we get them to stick that's what Jesus hopes for us. Our unity is a great evangelistic tool. Jesus wants our unity to be a force that attracts the people of the world who are drowning in chaos and division. So, with all this, we see that we must become one. That is what Jesus is praying for us. Because Jesus is praying specifically for us, for the Christians in the future that come to know him by the words of others. That's us. Jesus prays that we might become unified with one another. Jesus prays that we might become unified with him and with the Father. And Jesus prays that our unity becomes that force that attracts the world to us. And we have the opportunity to honor him by fulfilling his wishes, by fulfilling his prayer. We can increase our unity with one another by striving to know him better and by striving to love one another better. We can assure that we have unity with him by accepting the salvation that Jesus has offered us. Jesus wants us to share in the glory that he has given him. Jesus wants us to share in the glory of God in heaven for eternity. And we can assure that by allowing Jesus to take away our sins and allowing Jesus to, to um, join us to him in glory, to allow us to become fellow children of God. And we can assure, we can honor Jesus' prayer by creating the unity that Jesus wants us to have and showing the world that unity. And so we now have the opportunity to make that change. We have the opportunity to come together and to become one. So maybe some of you have yet to take on the glory of God. You have yet to become one with the Father and one with the Son. Now's your opportunity to do so. If you will be baptized into Jesus, you take on the glory of Jesus, you become a child of God, and you assure that you will be a part of the glory of God for eternity, fulfilling Jesus' wishes for you. Second, maybe you're not so good at the unity. Maybe you're not so good at showing love and sacrifice, sacrificial love, and your, your relationship with God is struggling. And maybe you need our support in our prayers. Now is an opportunity to come and to gain help, to gain the prayers of the church. Um, part of unity is relying on one another, and that's what we can do in this time. Uh, the lesson is yours. If you have need to, to become a part of the glory of God, if you have need to, to become united within the church, if you have any of these needs, please come forward now as we stand and as we sing. Have you been to